Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. It's a delight for me to have been asked to spend an hour or so with you talking about transit, particularly early and late transit, and uh, thank you all for coming out. Perhaps it's because I grew up two blocks from the car barn, the streetcar barn in Mount Pleasant at 13th and Main. There you are. Um, a boyhood friend who still writes music and writes it beautifully for Vancouver or Canada's largest newspaper, the Toronto Star, William Littler. We've known each other for a hundred years and every time we get together, the first thing he does is look at me like this and say, streetcars? <laughs> well, what can you do? I've brought along, for those of you who missed it, 61 years ago, I've brought along five copies of the 24-page buzzer that came out at that time. For anyone who failed to get it at that time, 61 years ago. So just six copies, you'll have to ask, of course. And the most recent book of mine, done with wonderful uh, co-author Heather Kahn, is the only one of the four books I've written still in print. And it really deals, I'm not flacking for the book really, but it really deals so strongly with what my talk with you will be about this evening. And that's Vancouver's glory years. I brought five copies along, five of mine. They retail normally for $40 and no shipping and handling is not included. Um, but I would be willing to sell to anyone who's interested. I brought five copies, a copy for $20. So the buzzer is a giveaway for anyone who needs that. And for anyone who'd like a copy of this, $20 will do it. Thank you. No. No. Now I've got to do the thing, don't I? <laughs> As I was growing up, there weren't many books on Vancouver. When I got into my 20s, there was that wonderful book by Alan Morley, Biography of Vancouver, that's not what he called it. Eric Nichols' book on Vancouver, also a biography, both quite complimentary in many ways. And then the wonderful effusion of Major Matthews' various publications. And then I discovered Cecil Maiden's wonderful book, which was really BC Electric oriented. But very recently, I came across something that an old friend, Francis Mansbridge, archivist in North Vancouver at the museum for a number of years, something that he had written, and I picked it up very recently, and I've decided that as short as it is, it's beautifully succinct, and it helps set the stage for 1890 Vancouver. So, Francis Mansbridge. The most significant 30 days in Vancouver's history began on May 23rd, 1887. And the date is on the back of your handout. When the first transcontinental train arrived in the city, linking Canada from sea to sea. By June 13, that's about three weeks later, the SS Abyssinia had arrived in Vancouver from Yokohama loaded with tea and silk. Cargo was placed on a transcontinental train and arrived in New York one week later and in London one week after that. Vancouver, in 30 days, is transformed from backwater into trade gateway. The city of Vancouver had been incorporated in 1886 with a population of 1,000 followed quickly by its destruction by fire. But this setback was temporary. With the arrival of the CPR the next year and its choice of Vancouver as western terminus, the city's future as industrial and commercial hub was assured. At the same time, the need for transportation as an extension to the railway became apparent. The first Granville Street uh, Bridge opened in 1888. Now, the second one will open in 1909. I'll show you a photo of it later, a rare photo that shows both bridges, the 1888 and the 1909 one. 
Streetcar service to New Westminster began in 1891. Industries such as the BC Sugar Refinery set up shop, and before the turn of the century, Vancouver had resoundingly replaced Victoria as the center of population and activity on Canada's west coast, becoming BC's focal point for entrepreneurial initiative with a population of 13,709 in the 1891 census. Now, having set the stage, let me first look at the handout with you. Would you look at the back side, that side where I have all the dates? I want to just do a little bit of this, hopefully not teacher style with you. Would you notice the first date, of course, the incorporation? The fire occurred, for those of you who have pen and want to add it in, it, it was on June 13. Now, when it was incorporated, it was not that Vancouver that we know today. The western limit was Alma. The eastern was Nanaimo. It didn't go farther south than 16th, except between Fraser and Knight, roughly, when it did an oblong up to 25th. So Vancouver, until 1929, was within the confines of 16th, Nanaimo, basically 16th, or Alma, and the waterfront, of course. 1891, 1890, June 27, streetcar service began. And one asks immediately, is it true what seems to be kind of general colloquial knowledge that the streetcars were, they were rattle traps, they clinked and clanked and noisily made their way through the streets? The answer is no. Vancouver was in the vanguard of this. In 1888, only two years earlier, the first streetcars in the world ran in Richmond, Virginia, of all places. And the streetcars were beautiful. You'll see pictures. 1891, the interurban service began to New Westminster, and just as the arrival of the CPR in Vancouver spelled the end, in a way, for Victoria, the interurban run to New Westminster, uh, that sapped in New Westminster of that energy that it had been accruing all these years. People wanted to come to Vancouver. 1891, October 8. Now, let me add in a couple things that aren't there. They happened quickly. 1892, South Vancouver came into existence. Outside of Vancouver, Boundary Road, right down to Fraser Street, incorporated as a municipality. Burnaby, the same year. Now, 1893, we went into the deepest trough of a depression. It was an enormous depression. And the three streetcar companies that got going in Vancouver, New Westminster, and Victoria, they all went bankrupt in a big way. So you can see then, at 1897, April 3, the British Columbia Electric Railway Company Limited was incorporated on Threadneedle Street in England, gathering together these three bankrupt orphan companies, and it was just up, up and away from there. 1905, ah, that's the Arbutus Corridor, the name it's taken on in the last few years, and from 1908, to about 1912 and into 1913, expansion here in Vancouver, the kind of expansion that even today we would find hard to believe. Taking a look at newspapers of that time, and I've gone, to mo gone through most all of them, the ad said, close to streetcar line, only half a block from streetcar line. That was so important. Well, an interurban from Marple to New Westminster in 1909, 1911, the Burnaby Lake Line. 1922, we changed from driving on the left-hand side to driving on the right-hand side. There's the date. The first bus, when did it begin? 1923, BC Electric, of course. First trolley coach in 1948. The last day of streetcar operation when this buzzer came out, April 22, 1955, the last interurban, and you might say, why so late? That one last line, Marple to Steveston, 
the BC Electric was waiting for Oak Street Bridge to be finished, and then a new transit system was installed. 61, the social credit government expropriated BC Electric. Now, we went into a time that will be looked back upon as a kind of a trough, an intermezzo of sorts in musical terms. Interurbans were gone. We were having buses and trolley coaches, but there was nothing real quick moving us along as there had been. More cars than ever. We needed freeways. And then Vancouver did that extraordinary thing, and it was truly extraordinary. In the mid-1960s, it rejected. Have you ever seen the book that sets out how the routes will crisscross in and around and through and over Vancouver? It's a document to see. We don't have that, but what that meant was that we needed to move people, and the gridlock was everywhere. So SkyTrain came online. Would you notice below? I've said a transit renaissance began. It truly did. Today we have 40 miles, about 70 kilometers, of fast transit. We have the Expo Line, the Millennium Line, following Low Heat Highway pretty well, the Canada Line, a different type of operation going out to the airport and out to Richmond, and the Evergreen Spur, I'm going to call that, that, going to Port Moody, will add more. These have been extraordinary happenings, a real renaissance. For those of you who are not sure of what the Expo line is, it's that very first 1986, beginning January 3rd operation, following almost entirely the old Central Park line from Vancouver to New Westminster. The Millennium Line, this is the line that heads out Low Heat Highway direction and is kind of a counterpart to the Gong, but on the other side of the lake, Burnaby Lake Interurban Line. And of course, it hooks into New Westminster beautifully. And the Canada Line, of course, out to the airport and Richmond. The dates are there. We have this fast transit. I haven't included the um, West Coast Express because it doesn't stop in Vancouver other than that it stops at its terminus. But here is, a, shall we say, a brief sketch of how we began with an enormous flourish. And by about 1923, you see the date there, we're saying, people are saying, you know, buses could be a reality if we improved roads and we're growing so quickly in, po in population. Would you go over to the map now? Would you notice, and this is 1929, would you notice that between Dunbar on the left and the Arbutus Corridor interurban line, there is no streetcar service, but it was needed, and when it was put in, it was a bus line, the McDonald bus line. Notice between Oak and Maine, when a line came in, it was a bus line. South Granville, it was a bus line too from 41st South. And how about between Fraser then and Victoria? That was the night road or night street bus line. So by 1930, a year after this map, when it came to developing transit in Vancouver, it was buses. This is it for streetcars and rail here. Now, as I noted on the other side, don't need to go back to it, but in 1929, Vancouver, Point Grey, South Vancouver amalgamated as one. So it's quite possible there are folks sitting here in our audience, I'm not one of them, but people here who were born when Vancouver was still that smaller, Alma to Nanaimo to 16th Vancouver. If you were born before 1929, that's you with the smaller Vancouver. A couple things to notice on the map, if you would, please. I thought you would really enjoy this map. It shows the, the streetcar lines double track and the decade in which they were built. But I'd like you to notice Dunbar on the left side. 
Can you believe that if you went by streetcar up Dunbar, before 1923, the streetcar came along Broadway, went along 10th Avenue to Crown, south on Crown to 16th, east on 16th to Dunbar, and then up Dunbar. That curving diversion that we today know so well was built in 1923. And part of its building, the photographs of the Finnish street are absolutely beautiful, easy to Google up. The streetcar line was an integral part of that street. That explains that. Now you might say, how about UBC? That was early enough. Yes, that was 1925. So go a little farther west and you'll see Sassamat and 10th. One block east of Sassamat is Tolmy. A little bus depot was built and BC Electric buses ran from Tolmy and 10th from 1925 out to UBC. Now, you might be looking at Broadway on the left side of the map and you're noticing that Broadway was not completed until after 1920, and this seems strange giving broad, given Broadway's strength today. Well, everything moved on 4th Avenue. 4th Avenue and then up Alma, and notice the crisscrossing across Alma by 1929, that's abandoned. Broadway, which stopped for years at Trafalgar, just under the W of Broadway, was extended over to Dunbar, and so things went. I'd like you particularly to notice 41st Avenue. Do you realize that there were, and I'm talking to old timers, and I'm one myself, did you realize that from Granville to Maine on 41st, even though there wasn't a soul in sight, the streetcar tracks had all been laid? And that between Granville and Oak Street, the streetcar tracks are still under the pavement, never having been used once. That section from Oak to Maine in the wilderness, that was torn up. One more thing, I think, to point out to you. Come to the end of Falls Creek, and you'll notice Main Street going straight down, and there used to be a streetcar line going out Georgia Street, indeed, right up to Victoria Drive. Now, the viaduct, our first viaduct was built, finished in July 1915. July 1915. Tracks were laid on the viaduct. Streetcars never ran on the viaduct. One reason is always given, and that is that the bridge was not constructed to a high enough standard to take what they felt would be the jarring of the streetcar operation. But I think, and someone needs to research it, I haven't gotten around to it yet, I think the merchants in downtown, down on Hastings and Powell and Cordova, which was the center of our downtown university, or our universe where Woodward's used to be, and Army and Navy still is, I don't think they would have gladly countenanced the main street car coming down Main and then making that left turn across the, the viaduct at Georgia, I don't think that would have been countenanced for a moment. So there you are. It's an interesting map, I think. It's from Harlan Bartholomew's big plan for the city of Vancouver. And you've got everything double-tracked. And you'll notice that uh, in many cases, a street would not be have its second track until much later. How far did they go south? The Oak Street line actually connected with the interurban, but no connection was ever made in service. Main Street, however, Main Street right down to the interurban. Have you ever wondered how a little mountain was carved out as it was carved out? I'll tell you. It was a quarry, and there were three lumber mills on Ontario Street. And locomotives would come off the interurban line. You see it going around the, along the bottom, Eburn, New Westminster, interurban line. And the locomotives would climb up Main Street, that's a stiff hill, right to 33rd. By the way, it says 34th. It used to be 34th. Within your and my recollection, it's 33rd. And then the track's not shown, but it would go west to Little Mountain, and the quarrying would take place, and the locomotive would haul the cars out. 
and south on Main Street down to the interurban line, which of course was a railway line and it could be taken away by freight. We did not take pictures. I'm so envious of friends in North and South Dakota, Minnesota and Montana. They took photographs of what was happening. We took some, but not very many. There's no photograph that I know of of a railway doing quarry work or a spur line into, into uh, the Little Mountain area. But it was there. I have the track maps and I know from old timers, of course, and from BC Electric's own materials that it was done. Photographs, they don't seem to exist. Now Fraser went down to Marine Drive and that was lonely. It was only when television came in 1950, 51, 52, that people said, we're moving to the South Hill. Why? Good television reception, we can get KVOS. <laughs> did people move on that basis? My parents did. We moved to 60th and Main in May 1951. The streetcar down at that end was gone, but it still went as far as 50th and Main. So Fraser went down to Marine, Victoria Drive went down to 54th, where the trolley coach loops today. There's only one picture that I've been, been able to discover that anyone ever took at 54th and Victoria of a streetcar, and you'll see that as well. Joyce Road, that was the end of the line as well. Anything else on the map? I think that covers everything, but let me ask you, just before I uh, proceed with pictures, do you have any questions about anything that's on the map? Yes. Grew up on Main Street, 19, 1931, lived there all my life. There was a jitney that went down from 49th. Yes. And it go down that way. And also, I went to J.O. and they have a special that came from 14th and Main, the, the, the barns. And John Oliver's special book, 33rd, there's tracks, there was tracks there. That must have been part, it only went from 33rd and Main over to Fraser and down to J.O. Thank you. There were all sorts of, I'm talking to this, there were all sorts of specials. A late friend of mine, Paul Johnston, he rode that same trip. It went every school day from the barn of Main Street and 14th, south on Main to 33rd, it's 34th here, then across 33rd to Fraser, and up Fraser to John Oliver. Now, Henry, I was told in my travels that that's where the motorman kind of practiced. Now, I'm You're absolutely right, and so I can add that too. Motormen learned their stuff on 33rd Avenue. There was no regular service after a while, and so streetcars were taken up there, and motormen did their thing along 33rd Avenue. My goodness. Any other question before we go? Yes. Uh, I notice you show Oak Street all the way down. And it seems to me I, I went on Oak Street in 1944, and I thought we turned around there. And did one of them go up, up to 25th, and then you could turn around there? You're talking about the Oak Street line? Yeah. What happened on the Oak Street line was, as you see, it's thoroughly single-tracked after 16th, and there were passing sidings along the way. And the streetcars were double-ended, trolleys at both ends, one motorman in, uh, after 1933, and when it got down to Marpole, simply that trolley pole at one end was pulled down, the other one was put up at the other end, and the motorman took his equipment, went to the other hand, end, and away he went towards downtown. Yes? Uh, my father, uh, uh, um, who was born in 1906, uh, has told me about running streetcars in North Vancouver and, and Vancouver. He said that there, there used to be conductors who would collect the uh, um, fares while the motorman was still in it. What else did conductors um, do? Conductors did just that, but North Vancouver started its streetcars in 1907, 1906, 1907, and they went to 1947. But yeah, the conductor... That was the person for taking the fare, and there were different ways of taking fares. Early on, the conductor would walk through the car with what people called a coffee pot. It wasn't that, of course, but you put your fare in it. When we went to one-man operation on so many routes, especially the lightly traveled routes, 
in the 30s, during the Pre Depression time, the motorman and conductor were one and the same person, just as they are on buses and trolley coaches now. One footnote to that, and I think you'll be interested in this, you'll see pictures of them starting in the very late 30s and into the 40s, DC Electric took delivery of 36 beautiful streetcars called PCC cars, President's Conference Committee. And they were state of the art, 36 of them. And the union, DC Electric's union, were absolutely, adamantly, furiously even, opposed to them because there were just, would be just one operator. It was a great difficulty getting them going. Any other questions about the map? Yes. Um, you said that the barn was at 14th and Main. Yes. Um, but there was a facility in Kitsilano. Um, under Burrard Bridge, under Burrard it Bridge was a facility. It was for the interurbans, not for the streetcars. The streetcars called home Prior Barn, which was between Prior and Union Street on Main Street, on the west side of Main Street, and the other barn was at on Main Street between 13th and 14th with an upper deck for parking. So where that shopping is now, that was um, a car barn as well. So two car barns, Kitsilano was for the interurbans. One little comment, the interurban line going from Marple down at the bottom of your map to New Westminster says Eburn. Eburn became Marpole in 1916. Marpole was an ex extraordinary, active, positive, very effective CPR manager. And Eburn was named after him. And it so happened, I don't know if officially, but across the river in Richmond, that area came to be known as Eburn. One more question, yes. Uh, just a point of clarification. I think you said that the streetcar went up 10th to Crown. Yep. Turned south to 60. Turned south onto Crown. Onto Crown. And, and then, then went east on 16th and then kept going south on Dunbar. So there was a whole quadrant that it turned around. Yes, but it didn't use that Dunbar diversion, that nice curvy section. That wasn't built until 1923. So that was a later installation. And then the Sassamat, yeah. on 10th and Sassamat there, was that actually a turnaround? Or was it just a... No, not a turnaround, but at the very end of the line, in number 16, and I'm going to show you a picture. There are only two pictures, as far as I've been able, able to discover, of the number 16 at the end of the line at, uh, at Drummond and 4th Avenue, and it was a Y. In other words, here's 4th, streetcar would go like this, back onto Drummond, and then come back out. And that was at 16th. Did anybody experience going on the number 16 car to that point? Two folks, all right. Well, let's go to the photos, and uh, this is a very rare photo. It's Vancouver. I'm not sure where it is, and yet looking at it, you'd think maybe I should be, or you would want to be. I haven't been able to figure it out, but it's in Vancouver, opening day, six streetcars have arrived, and they're state of the art. They've been built in Philadelphia, and four of them are motorized. You can see the front one is, there's the trolley. And the trolley wire was supposed to be 12 feet above the ground. And this one has no motors. It's a trailer. There were two of those. And the idea was to hitch those on at high volume times. Now, this is at the car barn, where it was and as it was at that time, at the very beginnings, and you'll notice as carts were, or stages at that time, the vestibules are not enclosed at all. This is on Union Street from Hastings going south. Hastings, Pender, Kiefer, Union. This is on Union, half a block west of Main and on the north side. 
And so here are, this was actually the first streetcar on the first day, and you have the date in your handout. Now you might say, my goodness, they have six cars, and yet the numbering goes up to 14. Oh no, PR was alive in those days too. People come to visit, we start the numbering with number 10. And so it was. Take a good look at that, if you would. That, that's, to me, is a great picture. The staff nicely gotten out. I'm not sure who this is over here. Maybe the person who goes out for buns and coffee. Not sure. Now, here's a photo. Fairly recently discovered. This is Main Street, and the uh, electric company, Vancouver Electric Railway and Light Company, built this bridge, they attached it to the Main Street Bridge that was already there. This is a bridge 770 feet long, just for the streetcars, and there's a streetcar right there, number 14. And you're looking south, there's Main Street going up, there's Mount Pleasant. And you might say, wait a minute, not all of you will, but there's water over here, and of course the water went right over to Clark Drive and for the building of the two big railway stations, the Canadian Northern and the Great Northern Northern Pacific Union Station, that was drained and uh, an extraordinary job it was. And it was ready to go by the time trains were running in 1915-16. Now, the streetcar line as built went up to Second Avenue only then north to Powell. It went east on Powell as far as Campbell only, but west on Powell, south on Carroll, west on Cordova, south on Camby, west on Granville, sorry, west on Hastings, and then south on Granville until a spot between Pacific and Drake, 3.35 miles in all. That was the beginning. And within, before the end of the year, before the end of 1890, streetcar line had been built up the hill to, as it said at the time in the Vancouver News Advertiser, the newspaper of the day, the town of Mount Pleasant. By the way, the News Advertiser was the first newspaper in Canada printed by electricity. Another thing to say, that three days after streetcar service began, and you know from your handout when that was, three days after the same company instituted electric light operation. So by July, by early July 1890, four years after incorporation, Vancouver had a first class transit operation and a first-class lighting operation. Now here's one of the early streetcars. If only we had it in color. Beautiful detailing work here, gold I would suspect. This was dark green, I suspect this was too. Notice the louvers here, sun shines in. This was pulled down, it was up in the ceiling. Now there was just one transverse I think that's the right word, one bench along here, one bench on the other side. And the seating, apparently, the seats went in so deeply that the news advertiser got really quite a few letters to the editor, especially from women saying, can't we do something about this? We can't get up out of the seat. So I don't know if anything happened, really not very much, but this is a great study of what it was like. This. Vancouver Electric Railway is even what it was before it amalgamated, before streetcars began with the lighting company and, and became the Vancouver Electric Railway and Lighting Company. Here's the motorman, here's the conductor, here's his girlfriend perhaps, or his mother. Notice, here's the destination, Westminster Avenue, today's Main Street, four-wheel truck, Speed limit by charter, six miles an hour. There were 18 miles of road in Vancouver, not one of them paved. Streetcars, they were important. 
This is at 16th and Main. 16th Cross is here. There's the general store that was there. This is a wonderful study of early streetcars, an open one. Lacrosse, of course, it is our national sport. MP, Mount Pleasant. This, my, we don't want to call it a cow catcher, but if that hit you in the ankles, you'd know. And of course, we did have some open cars. The first cars weren't, but later cars came and they were open. When British Columbia established a railway ministry in 1912, open cars were gone. That was the end of that safety concerns. But that's a beautiful study. Notice the vestibule still open. Same spot, there's the general store. It's closed in now, thank goodness. F is Fairview. Very fine study, this one. Here's the conductor and the motorman. Were the evils of cigars advertised then? Yes, there we are. This is from the Vancouver Hotel, the original one. You're looking north, east, onto Granville. Can you imagine it? That's Granville Street between Georgia and Dunsmuir. Hudson's Bay is right here. What year do you say that is? Pardon? What year do you say that is? That's 1891. Will it be time for Tim to ask a question? No, ask a question. All right. I can now see why um, we use a, a term of a streetcar parts, because in the old days, horses would, would pull the street uh, cars uh, along um, uh, 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 tracks, and, and, and because the horses needed them, um, hay and, and, and straw, that's why they were, uh, that's a legacy from when horses pulled vehicles, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, we were to have horse cars. The stable was built on 2nd Avenue, just off Main Street, just west of Main Street, and the horses were ordered. What to do with the horses? Garvin's Ice and Fuel, do you remember them? They bought them and deliveries and over the years, I remember in Mount Pleasant where I grew up, uh, Garvin's uh, vehicles being towed by horses. One of the councillors, when the vote was for streetcars, electric, he said, I am voting no, and that's on the record. He was of the opinion that we riding the streetcar ran the risk of being electrocuted. Here, is, here we are in front of Victory Square, looking west. When anyone came to visit, we built arches. As a matter of fact, Lumberman's Arch, which was torn down in 1947, originally stood at Dunsmuir and Granville. We liked it so much, we saved it and took it to Stanley Park and set it up there. Finally deteriorated to such a degree, it had to be torn down. By the way, that streetcar is coming at you. It's not 1922 yet. Traffic is on the left-hand side. Is that a church? No, this is not a church. I, I'm not sure what the name of the building is. Windsor Court, thank you. Ah, now. Did we have a tourist association in 1903? Indeed we did. Here's the first streetcar line from 2nd and Main, you've got to turn on your side a little bit, out to Powell, then out to Campbell Avenue, and here we are, Carroll, Cordova, Camby, Hastings over to Granville, and then just between Drake and Pacific. And look what's already been added. This going along Broadway was thought a pipe dream. As a matter of fact, it was such a pipe dream that for over a year and a half, it was shut down. No one was riding there. Imagine getting off there today around Heather or Ash, Camby, my goodness. This is at the cemetery, which is off 33rd. It's still there. And the people living there, this is 1899, they campaigned vigorously to have the cemetery line name changed. They didn't want that. So what did they want? Well, we'd like the Mountain View line. So they came home and went, this streetcar went up Main Street to 33rd and then across 33rd to Fraser and it was called 
the mountain view line. Now, this is a little bit more civilized. This is leather, and if it hits you, you're probably going to make, uh, you're going to make an arrangement to lie down there in some way. It's better anyway. Stanley Park. Stanley Park, open car. Cordova Street. This is Camby going up to Hastings, so you know exactly where you are. There's Carroll Street down there. That's the Celtic Pub. Never been in there. People say good things. Look at the traffic. One cyclist. Almost hit the gentleman there. Very nicely gotten out, isn't he? Very nice dress here. I wonder what the cuisine at the Savoy was like. This is right across from Army and Navy. This was Vancouver at its best downtownishly. Cordova up to Carroll from Camby, Hastings the same. This is where you went. Well, look, infrastructure was huge. This is 1904. Tracks being replaced at Hastings and Maine. There's the Carnegie Library still there. There's the earlier City Hall. I remember it. Now, that doesn't give me any points, but I do remember it. Long gone. But installing track was a forever thing. Yes, track was certainly replaced. Well maintained. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is Broadway and Maine. Can you imagine? This is 1905. This is a single truck car, four wheels. This is one of the brand new eight wheel, double truck street cars built that very year in New Westminster. And here's the hill going from Maine down to First Avenue and on downtown. It's a wonderful picture. Telephone wires, yes, they're there. But I think when all is said and done, my abiding question is, who are these people? What's going on here? And here's a cart, not much traffic, and yes, yet there are people around. Notice Tetley's Tea already casting its tentacles into us, and a church where the Lee Building is now. Carroll Street, Hastings, you're looking a little eastward. There's the Carnegie Library there. Very rare shot, this one. Well, here you are at Dunsmuir and Granville, and there is the second CPR station, torn down in 1914, chateau style, a beautiful structure, architecturally, but already too small. The building we know now, where SkyTrain comes in and CBUS, that was completed in 1917, just to the east. But look at this. Greetings from the Progress Club. Now, I'm not sure who this is for. I could research it. And by the way, those of you who are interested in Vancouver's arches, there is a wonderful book, recommended highly, on Vancouver's arches. We had many. They went up for an occasion, afterwards torn down. Well, here we are in Hastings, looking towards Granville, of course. Here's the post office, finished in 1912. This is just after 1912. No marine building here yet, but notice uh, very nice lighting. No um, wires in view here. And here's a 1908 photo. To be working for the street railway, this was special. There's no doubt about it. And here they are, all dressed up for a photo. Here's the date right here. Names are all there. Yes, go ahead. Okay, you didn't know who uh, that, that artist, but I want to get it. But I do know, in 1912, the Duke of uh, Connaught came, and, and, and Campy Bridge was also called the uh, Connaught Bridge, so it could well have been that that, that was seen under construction. I, I'd like to think it was, but in fact, I've researched it, and it's not. Unfortunately, it's not for the Duke of Connaught. Uh -huh. It was not, no. Now, you're at Kitsilano Beach. You're at Kitsilano Beach, and it's an interurban style depot here. Do you know that <laughs> we could walk in five minutes to the point where this cuts right through the area just south of us here? I could show you exactly where it went. We've built on it, torn up the tracks, of course, to do so. Here's the little coffee pot for collecting fares. 
And I have a quiz for you. Here are the streets, or the areas. Kitsilano, Granville, Hastings. What's Harris? Georgia. Georgia. Thank you. Georgia, east of Maine, was Harris. Now we've come to civilization. This is 1914. If this hits you, you know what this does? It clasps you. It comes up like this. And so you find yourself pinned between this and that, either looking skywards or, to, or down, yes. So it's probably an improvement in all. Now, 1909, the new Granville Bridge. This is a beauty. The 1888 one is still there. It's going to be torn down very shortly. There it is. And this is the Granville Bridge that lasted until our current one was built in the early 50s. And again, we built way ahead of where we were. There was no traffic to cover a bridge like this. Didn't even get near it. Here's the Kitsilino Trestle, which many of you will remember fondly, going to the beach at Kitsilano, of course. They did. They were very fancy, yes. Here you are in 4th Avenue in Waterloo. And my good friend John is giving a talk, I think the day April 8, and he's going to talk, tie in real estate with streetcar line building. Um, it's a huge topic, and I'm sure John will entertain you mightily. So this is 4th. Waterloo, the streetcars westbound, it's a very new one. Here's an example of our lighting at the time. P&E, 1910. There's the race grandstand. You're looking south. This is Renfrew. This was a huge structure, the main structure. Hastings was virtually a non-entity. You came in this back way, the route we use today to go to Second Narrows Bridge. Notice, this is not 1912, you couldn't do this. People hanging on to the back of this closed streetcar. Here's a previous paint job, and here's the current one. Olive green, the red and cream did not come till 1926. Isn't this a lovely picture? Looking south on Granville, of course the Sinclair Center. Here's the older, no, the second Hotel Vancouver. Torn down in 1947 at Georgia and Granville. What a loss that was. The Royal Bank building, not built yet. It'll come yet. This building today is Burke's. And the streetcars are moving up and down. Believe it, this is Kingsway. What's, what's going on? Knight Road is down here. We're looking west. And Kingsway is being double-tracked. The two tracks are going to be placed here. This is what's called a shoe fly. It's a temporary track for the streetcar heading out to Joyce Road, or Joyce Street, as it is today. Pictures like this are also extremely rare. I remember only too well negotiating for this one. That's a BC Electric locomotive back there. Oh my goodness, yes. Robson and Granville. Here's our first opera house, opened in 1891, became the Lyric Theater, International Cinema. Wagner's Lohengrin was done there in 1894. We were cultured. Here's the first Hotel Vancouver, scaffolding of an addition designed by Rattenbury being put on it. And here, according to um, Dan Francis, this is where Louis D. Taylor lived Long-time mayor of Vancouver, no one was mayor for more years than Louis Taylor, and he lived right there. This is Robson. Notice the carts going up here. Main Street Bridge. Falls Creek went right in there. There is what became the Union Station, Great Northern Station, torn down in 1965. The Via Depot is over here, CN Station, and there was a bridge across Main Street, Falls Creek, coursed underneath and through. When we heard that, I mean, I was wondering, 
That's right. It came right up to Clark Drive, below Clark Drive. Yes, oh sure, it was right there, just, just off Main Street. This is Granville Street. You're looking south from about Pender. It's still left-hand drive time. And uh, skating at Trout Lake, well, Trout Lake is certainly there. Still, John Hendry Park between 15th and 18th, east of Commercial. And look at the streetcars coming down here. That was the way to travel. Stanley Park. I take this as the day of opening. This is just a guess. The picture came to me unmarked in any way. Look at the cars lined up, the causeway. I think it might be the opening of Lionsgate Bridge. Here's the Yacht Club, and there wasn't a loop there that the coaches used now and streetcars used later. This is how it was with Lost Lagoon here, of course. Well, there's Hastings Street again, and still bereft of, of the marine building, which would fill that in. But doesn't it look big city with these wonderful lights? Victoria has these today in quite enormous profusion. We lost them a long time ago. Why? There's the Main Street Bridge again. You're looking east. How do you like that? So next time, you're, if you didn't know this, if you're in, when you're in front of the Via Station, you've passed it going north. This is what you'd be on. 25th and Main. Most of these buildings are still there. And when is this? 1916. Um, now, oh my goodness. Now this was just a why for turning streetcars here. The streetcars did not go on King Edward here any distance. It was just a turning why. 50th and Main. And I have this here not only to show you what it was like to wait for the streetcar and not get in when the motorman was having a smoke up here, but also to show you that we didn't have doors here originally when these cars were built. They were wire screens and they opened up. And certainly they allowed for fresh air and uh, with smoking and any other odors, certainly there was a clearing going on, but it was decided sooner or later um, that that really wouldn't do. But those streetcars, when they were built, uh, that type of car between 1912 and 14 and 15, they all came equipped with these gates. This is 50th and Main. This is a wonderful picture at 26 and Fraser. You're looking north. You're looking north. This, it, actually in the original photo, you can read everything that's here. This plumbing outfit is still here. For Ellie and me, one of our favorite restaurants, recommended to you highly, it's called Batard Boulangerie, right there. And next to it is Ernest Ice Cream, not to be missed. But this is 26 and Fraser, and look at this. That's pretty portentous. One automobile, but it's loaded with five guys, and they're demonstrating to us what's going to take over after a while. That streetcar, is coming towards us. 1942, Denman, alias Georgia Auditorium. Kids being picked up. This is Denman, that's Georgia. They've been to hear the symphony orchestra. The big arena that burned down in 1937 was right there. Well, there's the car barn between 13th and 14th and Main. 13th and 14th Main. And these cars got up here by going up Quebec Street, turning on to Quebec. And of course, here are two snow sweepers. There's one of the beautiful PCC cars. And these cars with the crisscross at the front meant get on at the front, not at the back. This is a one-man car. Well, I'm just you used to work um, why uh, uh, did you I think an ordinary train that's right. They use turntables, much like my rotary thing here, much like that. Here we are at 25th and Dunbar. For me, the streetcar is a wonderful thing in that picture, but I'm sure for you as well, the absence of traffic on an everyday day. Goodness sakes, many of you will know exactly where this is. Well, this is 10th Avenue, 
you've gone west from Alma. You're about two blocks west of Alma on 10th, and you're looking west towards the university. Those houses are still there. This is 1948. There's Denman, later George Auditorium, on a rainy day, a 49 Ford, and BC Electric, when they got trolley buses and buses and decided they'd change the paint job to a cream, reverse the colors, and make this symbol red and some of the trim red, they did it to a few of the PCC streetcars as well. People who were not too positive about this insignia called it the BC Electric Tomato. Well, here you are in Sassamat. The photographer is standing on 10th. You might find that hard to believe, but that's 10th and Sassamat. And this is single track here. And this streetcar has been waiting for that streetcar to come up the hill from 4th, having gone along 4th from Drummond. And it'll come here to 10th on its way downtown. This is at Joyce Road, way, way over at the west end of Vancouver West and south, one of the new streetcars. This, I remember it. This is Boundary Road and Hastings, and the streetcars there, they didn't loop at Kootenay, a block west. The BC Electric had dug out a slot into the hillside north of Hastings, and the streetcars wide into that slot. So here we are, right on Boundary. This is on Robson. This is at 54th and Victoria. Well, you know where that is, Robson and the library courthouse is to the right. So I'm very anxious in having us experience those things we can't. I suspect there are many people sitting here who've ridden all the various lines, Millennium, Expo, and the Canada Line. This is of our past, of course, and we can take a look at it. Try this on for size. This is Oak Street at 29th, where the hospitals are. You're looking north. This, you won't believe. That streetcar is on 16th, eastbound, Crossing Camby. What you see there is where BC Electric and Pacific Stage buses used to be serviced. This is Camby. This is 16th. That's Main Street and 58th. Main and 58th. Fraser and 49th. Looking south. Look at the boards between the tracks. End of the line, Fraser and Marine Drive. The Blue Boy Hotel is over here. It has a different name now. And as with Maine, Fraser, this was all there was to Fraser. The cars worked up here together. There's a northbound car there. And this streetcar will Y this way, then head back downtown. Well, that's a question. The board to put the green truck, I guess that was put in a rainy cloud like us for the convenience of, of a passenger's getting on and off so they wouldn't get stuck in the mud. Ab absolutely, because the streets were generally at that end of the town not paved at all. So here we are on 16th. My elementary school is to the right. It's still there, but it's a newer building, Simon Fraser Elementary School. The photographer is standing on Manitoba Street looking west. And here comes the 16th Street car. How about these houses? Most of them are still there. The date, 19, or year, 1948. Nanaimo Street and 2nd. Here's where the Central Park Line crosses in the distance, where SkyTrain crosses now. And they're passing. How about this? Somebody's going to get it for this. This you will not believe. The person taking this, this is a, an official BC Electric photograph, is on a locomotive. This track has just been laid for streetcar service. The look, you are standing on Oak Street, looking west, up King Edward. Can you believe it? This is King Edward. You're looking towards Granville. 
and that's called a sun kink. And whoever was the foreman for laying the track did a really, really bad job. <laughs> On Renfrew Street at the Peony, I had to show you this type of car. It's not the clearest photo, but this is a streetcar that had a trailer with it. People on Dunbar saw this type of arrangement often. They were hitched together. People on Fraser saw this arrangement as well. Well, this is just a walk from here. This is the line going through to Kitsilano Beach, cutting through everything. The houses you see are still there, which makes it, as I've done, I've taken this photo, the original photo, walked around and said, oh my goodness, here's, yes, of course, there's a little bump in the road and so it is. That's on Carroll Street, you're looking north. There is the zigzag pathway that went over the CPR tracks to go to Union steamships so that you could take the dance crews up to Bone Island. <laughs> Booze cruise. Now, some color. Do you remember those? The last one ran in September 1950. I certainly remember them very well. My dad went to work. I was an only child. My mother would say, should we ride the open streetcar today? And as a four-year-old, I said, what else, mother? And away we went. This is at Victory Square, of course. There were two of them, and what a beautiful ride they were. This is worthy of a whole two-hour lecture on its own. I won't even begin. Teddy Lyons, Teddy Lyons yeah. This is at the P&E. At the P&E. This is at 11th and Main. Here's the Broadway Theater, long gone. There's Grouse Mountain. That's on Hastings, near Raymer. They were beautiful cars. They pussy-footed their way along immaculately. At the bay, at Hudson Bay, yes. What was the speed limit allowed? Speed, speed limit wasn't really, it wasn't an allowable thing. It had been bumped up to, after 1912, 18 miles an hour. And I haven't been able to find that there was an, an acceptable or no, a possible speed limit after that. Um, I'm not sure why not. Maybe I've not been able to discover it, but um, the streamlined ones went at their fastest and they certainly exceeded 18th going along Pender from Burrard to Cardero. They were moving on their way to Stanley Park. That's on Main Street, so a lot of color. I'll flash these through quickly. You see the province building, what was? Woodward's behind it, and you're on Camby Street, and these streetcars have just made the last trip in July 1952 on the Oak Street line. Now, you will not believe this. This is Oak and 57th. Here's the car barn. You're looking north, 14th and Main. This is 15th and Commercial. You're looking north. Pavement ended here. The interurbans coming from Vancouver, 3.6 miles to here, and then their own private right of way all the way to New Westminster. This was, this was King's College, a Christian school. Uh, and in my experience, boys who were really unmanageable in school, in regular school, were sent to King's College. This is at Maine and 34th. I wanted to make sure we had some color. This is at the end of the Grandview line. There's the Central Park line, the interurban line. And the car, streetcars come on the line, 18th here, and is now going down Findlay, back on 15th, and north on Commercial. Oh, they were beautiful cars. One man, this told you it was one man, this flare here, and uh, got on at the front. You could get off here, get off at the back, and I lived in Mount Pleasant and going skating. We always hoped that we would get a Hastings Street car that was like this one or that was this type because at the back, some of you might remember, was a Dunlapillo half-circle seat beautiful sponge seat, and six or eight of us guys could sit on it. It was wonderful. This is on Oak Street, on a snowy day. 
downtown Spencer's in the background, Eaton's. There is the Y at Drummond. You're looking south. This is the far west out outpost of the BC Electric Railway, the number 16. Why is he showing a 14? Because that's the route he's taking now. He's going to Hastings East, Hastings and Boundary, number 14. So he's going to come out, turn this way, and He's on his way. Downtown with one of the PCCs. Interesting cars always come into the picture. Shores Jewelers. Everything along here was going at that time. Georgia Viaduct from Main Street, the old one. See the streetcar tracks? There they are. Paved over a couple times, never used. That was torn down in 1971. Now we'll do the interurbans quickly. Here were the lines again. Our Butis Corridor, so-called, to Marpole, out to Steveston, to New Westminster, the Central Park Line, and the Burnaby Lake Line through Sapperton. There was also a line to Fraser Mills, one to Queensboro, and then the longest interurban line in Canada, out to Chilliwack. You're on Boundary Road, looking west, just under where SkyTrain is now. This is the well, this is even before the first day, which is on your handout. This is the Westminster and Vancouver tramway interurban. This is a streetcar type they used in New Westminster. That's an interurban, and they're testing. Look at the sign for Kingsway, which was called Westminster then, tramway crossing. Wonderful photo. Carroll Street Station, the original. This is Carroll Street here. This is Hastings. There's one of the original cars for the tramway, for the interurban. Here's the original depot. Just a fine photo. This is a Vancouver streetcar over here, out of the way. So there it is. You're on Hastings at Carroll. That's Carroll running down here. You're looking north, Westminster and Vancouver tramway. It would go, it would become bankrupt and would become part of the BC Electric, of course. There we go. No regulations. Hang on. If you're a man, you had to wear a hat. I would not be allowed in here, of course, this evening. These are very rare pictures. This one, especially rare. This is at Central Park Station, two interurbans passing. First year of operation, 1891. Thank goodness somebody had a camera. Now, I wanted to show you this. This is a builder's photo of this car. Brill built it. Now, the next picture, watch. That's on the Central Park line. It's had an accident, sure enough. This is at Central Park. Now, these are two of the later interurbans. Beautiful, big cars. And before, they were done up for multiple unit operations, so they had a Big cow catcher at each end, beautiful, beautifully done windows, etched glass, BCER in the etched glass. Here's the Carroll Street Station, the first one, Carroll, Hastings. There's Woodward's, the first Woodward's building. Here's the CPR crossing, which it did until 1934, until the tunnel was built. Here are the tracks going into the depot. Oh, isn't that good? They posed an interurban line, number 1011, Edmund Sappert, and I'm going to tell you exactly where it is. You're on Columbia Street. If you bend down there, you're going to, you're going on to Brunette. You're going towards Millardville. If you go up here, well, you can go to, well, no, you're going to go up here to Royal Columbian Hospital, which is right there. Central Park Line. This is near Joyce Street, and it came time in 1907. So much traffic to double track the line. So what's going on here? This is the only picture I've ever seen also of Central Park Line being double tracked. And here it is, not a great picture, but it gives you an idea of all the work that went into adding an extra track for two-way traffic. Oh, and they built beautiful interurban cars in New Westminster, the shops. Do you realize that almost 200, actually 192 
Interurbans and streetcars were built in Westminster in the shops. They won awards for them. Look at this one. This is at Granville Station. This is on the north side of Falls Creek. Granville Bridge is right there. Ah, you came below. And some of you are saying, is this the track then that went across the trestle? Indeed. And up until 1914, going up the Arbutus Corridor, they left from here, crossed the, the trestle, and made their way up through Caresdale. That's car Sumas, which became car 1216. When they cut the ends open, took this all off, and made it possible to connect the cars, they took away the names they'd given the cars and gave them all numbers, if this were in color. This is beautiful stained glass here. The cars are olive green, dark black boot topping, gold trim, electric marker lights here, Look at this, cow catcher in addition. They were splendid. These are the last three cars built in the shop in Westminster, and they operated right until the end, 1954, on the Central Park line from downtown Vancouver to Boundary. Believe it or not, this is Marpole, box car and all. You're looking east, you're standing on Hudson, this is the original little station there. There's an interurban coming from Steveston, single track. It'll come over to this side and head for Vancouver through Caresdale. Sometimes the crowd was too big for a streetcar, so an interurban car would be requisitioned. This is on 33rd at Fraser at the cemetery. And the people are going to the cemetery. Obviously, most of them have gone or haven't gotten off yet and an interurban car was called for the day's work. This picture came to light. Someone brought it to me not a year ago. Pictures keep surfacing. It's not high quality, but it really tells a story we want to see. Well, in 1914, this station was built for the line to Marpole, Steveston, and it was built on Granville Bridge. On, here's Granville Bridge. It was built on the west side near the south end of Granville Bridge and the interurbans came in behind. Granville Bridge is on the other side. It lasted fewer than 10 years. You would say, this is terrible. It's a beautiful structure. I'll tell you why. We changed to left-hand drive or right-hand drive and you came out of the interurban to catch a streetcar and you got a streetcar right in your purse. So a new station was built on Davy Street, and there it is, on Davy between Richards and Seymour. And this depot sufficed from 1924 until 1952. There was a waiting room in here, ticket office, and up here there were even bedrooms for guys off shift who could have a little snooze. Here's Marpole, not a, an ideal picture, but nonetheless, it shows something. It's a real railway station, lots of freight. Notice the semaphores. And here's the Oak Street streetcar, the end of the line, that long run from downtown. And as you see on your map, yes, the track connected at one time, but there was never service of any connection. Well, here's Caresdale. This is 41st. This is on the last day of operation in 1952. You're looking north with a little bit of a westerly cast. 41st is right here, and the station for southbound passengers is there. Caresdale Arena is right here. Venables and Commercial Drive. This was the only thing that hampered, that now doesn't hamper SkyTrain. This is the glory of the Expo line. Yes, it runs over the old Central Park line virtually precisely, but it is able to cut over everything, which of course the Central Park Line wasn't able to. 3.6 miles of streetcar, or yeah, streetcar line running to 18th and Commercial before they could cut loose. So here at On Venables and Commercial. Well, this is what it looked like along the interurban lines. Park Avenue, where's that? Park Avenue was BC Electric E's for Boundary Road. 
Nobody wants a boundary road. Park Avenue, Central Park Line is up there. Now, SkyTrain runs right over top of all of this now. Over, as the English would say, a hog's back, which it is. The highest point between downtown Vancouver and New Westminster at the wharf is at Dow Street, over top here, 462 feet above sea level. This you won't believe. This is First Avenue, looking west. Look at the substation at Nanaimo and First. If you've driven on First Avenue, you know it. First goes rushing westward here to the freeway, eastward here towards downtown. This is Slocan Station on the Burnaby Lake Line. Well, this is the foot of Main Street. I pointed out to you how the streetcar line dovetailed with the interurban line running Marpole to New Westminster, and interurban lines ran freight. And this is where the locomotives would turn and go all the way up Main Street, west on 33rd, and do the business that was there, Main Street Station. Well, you didn't want to see this, but this is Main Street Station again. There's my bike and there's me. This is 61 years ago. And I have to point this out. This is car 1225. That organization, which has BC Electric's genes today, is the Fraser Valley Historic Railway Society in Cloverdale. It has three interurbans. This one will begin operating the long weekend in May. It's operated the last two years. Please don't miss it. Ellie and I will be volunteers. We'll be there to greet you. Well, now some color as we finish in the next five minutes. This is at Columbia and Hastings and uh, streetcar or interurbans coming in from New Westminster. And uh, you, the interurbans that ran to Chilliwack and most of the ones to New Westminster on the Central Park Line had toilets and water coolers. Here you can see the two ventilators for the toilets and there you see oval windows. Toilets, one must be discreet. One must have an oval window. There they are. Well, here you are, Carroll Street Station. There was nothing like it in all of Canada. Interurbans leaving here on the Burnaby Lake Line, on the Central Park Line, both going to New Westminster, Chilliwack Line. It was enormous. The office is here, yeah. Red's a good friend. He's in that building, yes. And I still haven't gone to see him. Uh, Ellie and I were with him at an art show that just a couple nights ago. Thank you. Here's Woodward's, as it was. You miss it, don't you? Army and Navy, and here's an interurban train coming in from New Westminster. That's under the shed. They said we have the longest newspaper and magazine rack installation in all of Canada. Who knew? I guess you can say anything. This is at 22nd and Arbutus, what do you think? 22nd and Boulevard, looking to West Boulevard there. This interurban is also in Chilliwack, uh, sorry, in Cloverdale. It's virtually ready to run. It was built in 1905. You can tell how old it is, the math is easy, and it's in wonderful running shape. This is on the Gladstone trestle. SkyTrain runs right above this now. This is between Nanaimo up here and Victoria Road down here. It's over a thousand feet long. And to see an interurban running across that, well, I can just tell you, there are only two or three, two or three thrills in the world greater than, the, no, I'm lying. That was, it was fun to see them coming across. <laughs> this is near Collingwood West, Central Park. This is at Commercial and Broadway. You're looking north, and the interurban is just coming to a rest. It's a two-car train, Central Park, going to New Westminster via Central Park, and it's crossed over the CN Great Northern Line. And of course, the Millennium Line runs under there as well today. This is coming up to 37th and West Boulevard. It's just left 33rd. So it's past Quilchenna Golf Course, 
stopped at the station at 33rd, and it's climbing this curving hill, which is very, very clear on your map. It's that big S curve backwards on your map. Burnaby Lake Line, not much happened there. Most of the Burnaby Lake Line is buried under 401 Freeway. I could take you a couple spots where you can still tell where it ran, where it wasn't, or where it isn't freeway, but here's the Burnaby Lake Line. This is looking southeast at Commercial and 16th. Again, SkyTrain country today. This is 20th Street in New Westminster. That interurban kicking up a little dust is headed for Marple. By the way, 1216, that's that same interurban you saw in the builder's photo when it was beautiful olive green and had all the trimmings and it had no end doors. This is another picture you will not believe. You're looking northeast. This is Victoria. Right over here, running east and west, is First Avenue. Commercial is right here. Can you imagine boxcars here? Boxcars. That's the Burnaby Lake Line Interurban. Here's the spur. Here's Victoria Road Station. It's going to cross the street, and then it's going to go up a huge grade here and mount First Avenue and go along first all the way into Burnaby. This is crossing Boundary Road. Sorry, crossing Smith Avenue. Central Park is up there. There's an eastbound interurban. That's a 21st and Arbutus, 21st and West Boulevard. Trying to scatter these color ones around. This is at Nanaimo. This is having just left Marpole in the background. There's the grain elevator. It was there until the very, very end. Service is terminating. Central Park, Burnaby Lake Line. This is sixth and commercial. And this interurban has just come off the interurban line right here. Believe it or not, past those boxcars, curved here, and then on to commercial. How about this? Good grief. Well, this is many years later. There's my first car, 61 Pontiac. This is 1961 Collingwood West. Central Park line, Central Park up there. Joyce behind me, sorry, Collingwood East. The freight building, BC Electrics, is still there. This is gone. Freight still came in as far as Nanaimo. There's a foundry there and some other works as well. This is 61. Look at this. This is First Avenue. No, there's hardly any traffic. The tracks, the Burnaby Lake line ran right here. The trolley wires were supported here and the tracks have been gone here about three years, no more. It's all trees in the boulevard today. The fancy streetcars, no one would buy them. There are reasons for that. That's another half hour talk, I'm afraid. Here are the trucks. They were eventually sold for scrap. Terrible. And I show this at this point. We enjoy, I certainly enjoy what SkyTrain brings, the Expo, the Millennial, and the Canada, as well as the West Coast Express. How will these seem down the road to you and to me? And then one final picture. Almost 500 of our streetcars and interurbans were dealt in this fashion. The photographer, Vic Sharman, who passed away very recently, took this photo from Burrard Bridge. The streetcars and interurbans were stripped. All the metal was taken away. Car was pulled off to one side and it was set ablaze. And we torched I forget the exact number, but it's over 450 streetcars and interurbans in this fashion. How many survive? 14 BC Electric vehicles survive. Three at Cloverdale, actually four, a locomotive two. Two are operational. One will be shortly 
they are the only ones that are. As I said earlier, and I have a vested interest in, in the organization there, of course, but I really would have to say that if you, I couldn't say anything else, if you want to ride BC Electric, Cloverdale's the place. If you want to eat and not ride the BC Electric, you can read one or you can see one of our earliest streetcars, and it's a bona fide one in the Spaghetti Factory downtown, <laughs> car number 53. And I think my time, as a matter of fact, I know Michael and Bruce, my time is up. Thank you for coming with me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, thank you.